a usual scenario which we always face with. So I thought I will present this case. Uh, a 50-year-old female patient and a housewife who had pain since six years. You know, I had been following her up uh, since the age of uh, 44. Pain was gradually increasing. No any history of trauma. And I tried all you know, non-operative modalities of treatment and the pain wasn't uh, going down. So before, uh, I'll just quickly show you the x-rays. These are the x-rays uh, uh, at 50 years of age and uh, the more symptomatic uh, side is the left. Uh, I just wanted to ask the panel before we go on to the surgical management, you know, what are the various non-operative modalities they would try in an osteoarthritic patient who presents to them early on. So let's start with uh, Sachin. So what is your take, you know, what all non-operative, because we deal with this all the time. All of us in this room see patients of osteoarthritis. So it will be really interesting to know how each one tackles them. So typically I think if she's six years out, she'd probably done almost all of these non-operative treatments. Uh, you know, we'd probably go through the whole list like physical therapy, weight reduction, footwear modification, bracing, anti-inflammatories and um, you know, with injections I'm probably more biased towards visco supplement injections rather than PRPs and uh, probably they would, they would have taken all these uh, nut nutraceuticals as well. Yeah. So what's your One preference? How do you approach them? What is your take? This is the whole list but what would you advise? What kind of non-operative treatment do you recommend? So typically I think when I see them for the first time, I'll start at the lower rung of the pyramid, so I'll probably put them on physical therapy, you know, if they're overweight like myself, i counsel them for some weight reduction, and uh, depending upon their deformity, I may or may not advise bracing at the first instance. If they're obviously there, they have an effusion, I'll put them on anti-inflammatories or just give them analgesics, and I'll usually top it off with some form of nutraceuticals to start off with. Subsequently, if they keep coming back, then I might discuss injections about them and if maybe I have the third visit or the fourth visit, they're not happy or they're not seeing me anymore, then I'd probably counsel them about uh, looking at some surgical options, if at all there are any. Sabrina, so how do you start and when do you give intraarticular injections in case you do? I think uh, maybe the opposite. I think when at least my patients come into the office, they want a quick fix. They, they've usually been somewhere before they've got to me, but even if they haven't, if they have an effusion for sure, they get a cortisone injection on the first visit. I don't use a lot of NSAIDs. Um, I worry about um, GI issues, but I think you also need to think about, you have to do something on every visit. Nobody wants to come to the doctor and get nothing. So the first visit might be cortisone, the second visit might be an unloader, the third visit's hyaluronic acid or, or PRP. In the United States, H, hyaluronic acid is covered, PRP is not. Um, some people want the fanciest thing, so right now that's PRP because at least in the States, most stem cells um, are either off the market or too much work for us to do in the clinic. Mangal? Uh, I, let me ask Sachin a question before I answer that. What is the, what is the uh, surgeon's fee for injection of uh, hyaluronic acid? Which surgeon? This surgeon or Which any surgeon? surgeon, average? I think about 4,000 or 5,000. And the injection itself? I think it costs around 15 to 20,000. Yeah, so that, that, is, that is the biggest thing I think. It is, um, to me, none of these, if there is, if the alignment is not proper, yeah? If the alignment is not proper and I see a full length x-ray which shows that the weight bearing axis is medial, then physiotherapy, do exercises religiously, see if it is going to settle down. Mild medication like paracetamol, at the most maybe 10 days of a stronger things to allow them to do better uh, exercise, uh, that's about it. If, if they fail that, then they are candidates for osteotomy uh, realignment. Okay, Andreas? Parag, uh, I have a question for you. Is, uh, in the U.S. there's now emerging, um, you know, nerve ablation therapies. Okay. Where they do, uh, you know, the, the, you can either cryo it, you know, you can freeze it, or you can ab ablate it. So has that come to India? No, then? not yet. It's not yes, so it popular has. here. I've heard about it. But no, no, we have it. We, very we have it, have but it. it's not so popular. That's so what we're doing I'm doing genicular artery, you know, embolization and radiofrequency cooled ablation. Yeah, it's in there. Yeah. So, but uh, how are your results, Anil, with that? Uh, I, you know, 
it's not my results. I don't do it. But it's just something to, it's something to consider. Or you know, it's just some. Look, when your tool belt, tool belt is limited, to Sabrina's point, it's just something to consider. But there's not the science. There's two randomized uh, trials that shows improvement, but it still hasn't penetrate HSS by any means. I, I have a question to that in the sense of if the basic cause of that patient's pain, pain is, 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 a, is a biofeedback mechanism to protect you from injuring yourself more. You take away the pain and that's one of the issues with steroids. You take away the pain and don't, you know, correct the root cause. You're going to land up with trouble uh, later on, aren't you? Yeah, yes, I mean, it depends if you're low demand, I would disagree with that. Uh, if you're high demand, and you, you, know, you know, we don't inject cortisone into a 17-year-old basketball player, that's a different story. That's where I think they, that could cause trouble, but not for just for ADLs. My second question is for Sachin Mungal, what about uh, distraction arthroplasty? Have you done that in, in young patients, the way the Dutch do it? No. I know that the literature shows almost equivalent uh, results to an HDO. I have no experience. So I think, uh, you know, if all goes well, by the end of this year, we'll start uh, a randomized trial on distraction and uh, enroll about 25 patients in each group and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And Andreas, can you, you talk, you and I have worked a little bit with the implantable, sh we're, if we're going to go voodoo, let's go voodoo. Yeah, sure. So let's discuss uh, what's your, everything. What's implantable shock absorber? I mean, that's, you know, a 50-year-old female, let's just say her x-rays weren't as bad as that one. You know, kind of a root tear patient. W w tell us about your experience with, you've had, a, you know, done it for a five years now. So what Anil is referring to, there's a company called Moximit in the United States that has an implantable shock absorber where you have a pl essentially a base plate that goes in the femur, one on the tibia, and there's a, um, a, a polymer cylinder between that provides shock absorbing. I, what's nice about it is it's not a permanently altering procedure, it's not a permanent implant. If this doesn't work, you can remove it and you can do anything else after that. You can revise it with a uni, you can revise it with an HTO. I think it's an intriguing option. So it might add a tool um, to our toolbox. It certainly won't work for everyone. I think for KL4 it's, it's not really indicated. Um, I think Going back to the question of how much do we use these non-surgical things, yeah. to me it, it matters how comfortable I am with the procedure. And so if somebody comes and they are, let's say, in my mind, perfect for a uni, then I will try and get a sense of the patient's personality. Because if somebody is 55 years to 60 years old, they are a perfect candidate for uni, we have a discussion and some patients say, you know, I don't feel ready or I feel that they're not ready. And then I'm doing all of these options for as long as it takes. The patient needs to be ready for the procedure. There are other patients who come in, they said, I've had six years of pain. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't want to come and see you all the time for injections. I don't want to do physical therapy because it's expensive. Just do a surgery. But I think what's important is you need to feel out the patient, yeah. what they're ready for. And sometimes what you do is just really just help them think through the process until they make the decision. Okay, so these were the uh, long leg films. There was uh, Varus. So let me ask, I know what Sabrina will say and what uh, Mangal is going to say. So let me ask Anil. So obviously now we've tried six years of non-operative treatment. We are looking for a surgical option. What would be your treatment of choice in this particular 50-year-old lady who's a housewife? Uh, not to sound sexist, but most 50-year-old housewives don't tolerate osteotomies. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what her BMI was. Was her BMI? Well, 27. All right. So if she's light, then I would do a uni. Um, but I'm going to say total need just to show respect to my father at his meeting. Okay. Even though I don't do knee replacements. Yes. So, uh, Sachin, what would you do? A, a quick answer? And also to your father, too, because your father would do yeah, it only as well. Absolutely. You're going to see him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if it's bone-on-bone -bone disease, then for me, she gets a uni if she satisfies all the criteria of an anterior osteoarthritis. If not, then she gets an osteo. Well, let me ask you, what are your select indications or, you know, definitive indications for doing an HTO? I know this topic is close to your heart and certain indications for doing a, definitely a uni like let's say for metaphysical virus or, or things like that, can you just bring that out? 
So tibial osteotomy is indicated for an extra-articular deformity. It is not going to correct any intra-articular pathology uh, directly. A uni is going to correct your intra-articular pathology. It is not going to affect your extra-articular deformity. So, sorry? Huh. So if you have a significant um, abnormal LDFA, then I don't think a uni is a good option because it's you're still going to leave the knee mechanically malaligned. You can't correct too much there. If it is bone on bone disease, I would definitely opt for a uni in the presence of an intact functioning MCL, uh, intact lateral compartment and an intact ACL. Otherwise, everyone else either gets a tibial osteotomy or a knee replacement depending upon the other issues that are Okay. Damaged. Sachin, would you ever do both? What if they're eight degrees, nine degrees of varus? Yes. They have, an L, they have a malaligned yes. LDFA, would you yes. do? And they are bone on bone. Yeah. So Dr. Hernigo would do that all the time. I would do about about. I don't have too much experience. I have about 15 patients on whom I've done a single stage DFO with a uni. Okay. So let me show you what I did. The time is up. We did a uni. These are immediate post office because the patient wasn't really ready for a HTO. And uh, this is the result. One year she's happy. She's uh, six years down and uh, doing well. So. This is what we did for her. But of course, Mangal, you could argue the case on an HTO as well. Any comments? Sir? No, that's why I asked you to put that earlier X-ray. If you look at that, that X-ray that, and what he said, extra-articular. TBVA increase means extra-articular. So in this particular X-ray, it looked like uh, you know, the, the tibia per se is, is straight. Right. So more of an intra-articular. Then the other point which uh, Anil made female. You know, right. all of these things, a little bit of this, a little bit of this collects. And then, so I would not um, argue against a uni in that okay. kind of situation. But, so, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this case. And thank you.